A commander in chief with coronavirus is still the natural state favorite, but will that impact the down ballot? The countdown continues, and if ours isn't really a swing state, how much will it swing? Of course, there's one race in particular in which any movement could be crucial. Arkansas Week, next. Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR-FM 89. Hello again, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Weeks being measured in days, there are fewer and fewer of both until the nation chooses a president. And Arkansas chooses federal, state, and local officials. Also on the ballot, some judicial seats and some state and local issues. And... In a manner of speaking, on the ballot as never before, coronavirus. Perspectives red and blue in the next half hour. Doyle Webb is the Arkansas Republican chair, his Democratic counterpart, Michael John Gray. Gentlemen, thanks very much for being with us. Uh, uh, Chairman Webb, we'll begin with you. Uh, the president, uh, positive for coronavirus, the first lady, the Republican national chair, positive. How does this alter the campaign? What does it What does it do to the campaign? Well, you know, first we want to pray for uh, the president, the first lady, and for all those who have contracted the virus. Oh, this is such an unusual election year. It's hard to know how it will alter it. Uh, let's just hope that they uh, stay sequestered and are able to get out and get back on the campaign trail. Once again, I appreciate the opportunity to be on your show, Steve. Well, absolutely, Mr. Chairman, but uh, this is a situation in which the president has been, I think the adjective widely used is dismissive of the coronavirus. Now it's in the White House. Friday morning, the White House chief of staff says he fully expects other White House personnel will, will, will test positive as well. That's obviously got to have some political impact. And of course, it goes without saying everyone here, everyone, every decent person wishes POTUS and FLOTUS, a, a swift and complete recovery. But there's got to be a political impact, no? Well, once again, uh, th this virus has penetrated, as you said, the White House. It's penetrated homes and families and individuals who have taken the utmost care. Uh, it is certainly a concern for every American. Uh, once again, we don't know the impact that it will have, but I know that... Uh, the president has taken precautions with the country. I think we're in a better shape today to deal with the virus than we were back in April, March and April. And so I'm hopeful that uh, we will come through this and that things will get back to normal Michael John, uh, by the spring. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Michael John Gray. So, um, yeah, because I think back in March and April, it was just a hoax and it was all going to go away. Um, let me say first that um, political snark aside, uh, politics aside, um, this virus has affected many families, many people across this country, and um, our thoughts and prayers are with everyone who um, has lost a loved one, who has seen a loved one get ill, who has um, experienced real fears because of this virus. And especially our thoughts and prayers should be uh, um, with those in the White House, the President, and the First Lady, and those that um, surround them that may have been affected by this. Um, there is a time um, that politics should be put aside, and we have a genuine wish that everyone can come through um, things such as this. However, I, yeah, I do think, Steve, it is um, uh, it does have a political impact. Um, I mean, uh, not to make light, but the uh, president did dismiss this as a hoax in, in originally. Um, we just saw our governor yesterday, and I, I've said on the on the record, it's easy to Monday morning quarterback responses to this. But the governor yesterday at our uh, event at Springdale seemed to be spiking the football a little bit and um, talking about the successes and um, almost in a tone of how it was behind us. And we've seen Congressman French Hill talk about COVID in the past tense. And so why 
while it is a great tragedy of any American, any citizen in this world is uh, affected by coronavirus, I think that uh, if there is a, uh, anything to come out of this, that maybe those that had listened to the leadership and thought this wasn't a big deal um, will now see that we're not out of the woods yet, that this is serious, that, um, that there's still a lot of work to do. And until we have a effective treatment or um, a vaccine, then uh, we still have to be mindful and cautious. And um, this is real and, and people are suffering. Well, that's the clinical aspect of it, but I have to insist, Mr. Mr. Chairman Gray, do you see a political impact down ballot in Arkansas? But it, it, let me preface that by saying I don't think anybody expects rationally that 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 Mr. Biden is going to carry Arkansas. But could this could this diagnosis in the White House could it have any impact down ballot? Change. Well, I think attitudes. it's going to have a. Oh, I think it'll have a political impact up and down the ballot, even in a state that would um we would all expect um vote for the president although i think narrower narrower than it did in the past i think that um some people um depending on how the um president comes through this um depending on his rhetoric and his language around it which is never predictable um it will definitely have a political impact i think we're a couple weeks from seeing what that um impact looks, who it affects, which candidates affects more. But I don't think you can dismiss that it will have some political impact um, on the elections. All right. Uh, Chairman Webb, uh, down ballot. Do you see much impact? You know, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I actually don't see any impact down ballot. If if there is an impact, it will be at, at the federal level. Uh, I think that people vote uh, uh, their, for their neighbors and for people who have done good jobs. They look at the record of what someone has done as a predictor for what they will do in the future. Uh, so, I, you know, when, if, when you, if you're talking down ballot on justice of the peace races and races of that nature, I, do, I don't see any impact whatsoever. I don't see any impact in, in the congressional races. Uh, if there is an impact, it'll be at the presidential level. It's a little bit too early to predict that. And uh, we'll just have to watch and see how it plays out. Well, down ballot includes the second congressional district. That's the most spirited, uh, essentially the only congressional race that we're, we're running this, uh, uh, this year. Uh, give us your assessment. Well, first off, I don't think the coronavirus will have any impact in the second district race. Uh, French Hill will win that race. Uh, once again, uh, Joyce Elliott has lost uh, the, the race before when she ran for second district. I think that uh, as her record is developed and it's shown that she's the most liberal member of the Arkansas legislature, that people in uh, who, who will be going to vote will recognize that. They like the stable and good leadership of French Hill. Uh, and I, I believe he will be returned to Congress with, with a... Uh, fairly clear margin uh, in his place. Michael John Gray. Yeah, so Steve, let me first say that um, while the second district's getting all the, the news and um, with Senator Elliott's impending victory there, um, I would be remiss not to mention that um, a, a nurse practitioner in um, Northwest Arkansas and Mr. William Hansen down in South Arkansas in the third and fourth congressional district, respectively, are running hard races and plowing a lot of ground. Um, and so we are not just running one congressional race. We are running three. However, I, yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm capable, I'm capable of overcooking things, <laughs> Michael John. Yes, sir. So apologies yes, sir. to the to, you know, to the other three. Oh, no, no, the, uh, but I will say coronavirus is definitely impacted. And I can appreciate why the chairman wouldn't want to acknowledge that. The second district race, we have seen all seen, and if you haven't seen it, Google it, French Hill smiling in the Rose Garden behind President Trump in, in one of their attempts to um, take away the Affordable Care Act, to hurt people with pre-existing conditions, to make it harder for our Kansans and Americans to have health insurance, and he's smiling like the cat that ate the canary. So you, um, it, you have to only look to what are his responses now? What has he done to... Um, ensure that um, the president took this seriously, that um, Arkansans were protected through this. And like I said, and as 
last few comments, he's really spoken of Corona in the past tense. And um, that's not our job as leaders. As leaders, we're supposed to um, um, speak with seriousness and communicate the real risks that are out there while we try to find what mitigates it. And so I don't know that um, what Chairman Webb uh, um, Speaking of it, uh, to Senator Elliott's record, the attack I've seen so far um, that um, Congressman Hill has made on Senator Elliott's record, it was a bill that um, she stood by Governor Hutchinson, Senator Hendren, and I think 80 percent of the Republican legislature to um, pass the bill. And that's the um, that's the commercial that those of you are in central Arkansas are seeing on television. Um, that that's what Chairman Webb's talking about a record, but that was um, uh, while um, definitely modified for campaign, it was something she stood right beside our Republican governor and Republican leaders to support. So and I, I don't think we can label her the most liberal. And I, I think when you start looking to records and past the rhetoric, um, French Hills doesn't uh, really add up. Uh, well, Chairman Webb, no matter where Senator Elliott is on the liberalism index, uh, there has been steep, uh, sharp criticism uh, that her opponent's advertising or advertising done on his behalf uh, has really distorted her record. Your response? You know, let me let me be clear about one thing. If the people of the second district support the leadership and the job that Nancy Pelosi has done as Speaker of the House, then they need to send Joyce Elliott to Congress to support that leadership. And I think it's clear the people of the second district, the people of Arkansas, do not support Nancy Pelosi's leader, leadership and her divisive leadership in the Congress. It's a do nothing Congress. And we know that Joyce Elliott would join in that de not, de not divisiveness and would probably become the fifth member of the squad in the Congress, okay? And once again, as we get to whether advertising, uh, let's see who does the advertising, uh, let's see who develops the records and go from there. I think that when it comes down to November 3rd, the people of Arkansas will not want to send someone to the Congress that supports Nancy Pelosi in the Congress. Michael John Gray. Hey, Steve, we can just run reruns, right? I've even been hearing this for years. We we can't talk about talk about Congressman Hill's record. We can't talk about his uh, misleading advertising when he uh, would, in fact, be disparaging the governor and all the leaders of the Republican Party in Arkansas. So we go back to Nancy Pelosi, who has never been on the ballot in Arkansas, who will never be on the ballot in Arkansas. And then, frankly, Mr. Chairman, uh, um, with respect, a uh, backhanded that Senator Elliott would be a fifth member of the squad. I would hope you would have reason to say that other than the fact that she is a, 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 a um, African-American female. Um, I, I don't see Joyce Elliott being a member of anything other than a member of people that care about Arkansas, care about the second district, and are going to fight like hell, just like she has for uh, children, like she has with kids with reading disabilities, like she's fought to make sure that Arkansans and her Senate district have a voice. And she'll do that in Congress. But it's really telling and it's unfortunate because you did start this show with people vote for their neighbors and they vote on records and they vote for what they've done with people. But it didn't take you very long to go back to we don't have anything substantive to say. So we're going to invoke Nancy Pelosi, who I have never seen on my ballot in Arkansas. And I'm sure I never will. Well, uh, Chairman, Webb, let me note this. If if. Uh, and it will it would damage, uh, I suspect, in just pure terms in Arkansas politics, it would be more harmful for Senator Elliott to be tied to Speaker Pelosi than it would be to Mr. Hill to be tied to Mr. Trump. But he is tied nonetheless. He has generally been most supportive and has has not taken issue with any of of uh, the president's more pointed observations. Uh, you know, I have to say that Congressman Hill has been supportive of the president when a presidential proposal has been good for the American people. He has been very reluctant to support the president when things were not too uh, supportive of the American people and the people of Arkansas. Now, let me say Nancy Pelosi is on the ballot in Arkansas. When you vote for Joyce Elliott, you are voting to keep Nancy Pelosi Speaker of the House. And 
Michael John, you don't need to throw the race card. You, you know that I am not a racist. You know that th that has nothing to do with her being a member of the squad. It's her liberalism, her liberal views that will bring her into that squad. So shame on you for even suggesting that I would use a racial overtone. Well, Mr. Gray. Well, if uh, if um, that was not your intent, I will definitely take that criticism. I I will say I cannot see into the heart I'll of people. Your I can only I cannot see into the heart of people. I can only base an observation on past uh, performances, past um, productions, and we have seen from the Republican Party. Um, since the um, inauguration of President Obama, we have seen since the Republican Party in Arkansas, and we have seen them follow President Trump lead to fan the fires, to try to divide us uh, along color lines. And that seems like a backhanded comment. Mr. Chairman, if it wasn't, um, please accept my apology. But um, history has shown that you guys have had been successful when you try to fan those flames of division. I want to say real quick, back to the content, uh, Congressman Hill has been reluctant it, that's that's a failing. Congressman Hill has not been adamant in speaking out against the president when he has done things to hurt Arkansas. He has not been adamant when the president has said things like um, asking a white supremacist group to stand down and stand by in case he needs them. Um, silence um, in not supporting the president is not enough. We're in a time, Arkansas is a small state. We've got four members of uh, the House of Representatives, but we don't need people that just like, well, I don't like what he's saying, so I'm going to be quiet. I want, we want people that are going to stand up and say, president or not, same party or not, this isn't good for the people I represent, and I'm not scared to say it. And he's not doing that. And in this day and in this time, that's a failure. All right, Mr. Webb uh, and uh, Chairman Gray, let me move on to something else. The debate last Tuesday night, uh, by anybody's estimation, something of spectacle, I suppose. Your thoughts. Did he damage himself? Mr. Trump. Are you asking that of me, Steve? Yes, yeah, Chairman Doyle will. Um, you know, the debate was a, a failure in uh, giving the two candidates the opportunity to explain what they see as far as America in the future. There's no doubt that the president, there's no doubt that uh, former Vice President Biden both love this country, and they both have divergent views of what should be done in the future in this country. Uh, President Trump needs to emphasize his record. He has a great record of uh, low, low unemployment, uh, highest unemployment among all the categories in America, reducing taxes, reducing regulation. And Biden needs to be given the opportunity to explain what he wants to see in America and, and answer questions of the uh, commentator. Uh, and I hope that as we move to a second debate, that that can be more productive and be more educational. There's no doubt that both candidates love this country uh, and both of them are very uh, emphatic on uh, the fact that they want to be president. What, what, uh, Chairman Webb, was your, was your nominee too hot as some Republicans have contended? Well, I, I think he was too aggressive. Uh, if that's your question, I think he was too aggressive. I think that that shows his uh, uh, love for the country and his concern that it will go in a direction that's not good for America. Uh, so that would be my view, okay? I think that on the other side, I think Senator Biden or former Vice President Biden was very uh, lethargic. Uh, he didn't answer some of the questions, and I think that uh, he should be given an opportunity to answer some of the questions that are posed to him. All right. Uh, Chairman Gray. Yeah, when I used to yell back at my dad I'd, and he'd tell me to stop, I'd say, I'm not yelling, I'm just being emphatic. That didn't work with him. That doesn't work now. It was ridiculous. The debate was ridiculous. The president set the tone. The moderator was in a position for how do you call down the president of the United States for not... Um, trying to engage in civil discourse. I was upset um, at times that President Biden, Vice President Biden joined the fray. Um, I, the stories I've heard over the last few days, people who um, 
voters and um, 15 and 16 year old children who sat down to watch their first presidential debate, some with notepads and it was a school assignment and some that were voters that wanted to really understand the positions on the issues and what the president brought to the table. I don't see it as love for the country. What I saw was not wanting to answer questions, uh, wanting to bully, wanting to set a tone, wanting to really mimic what his record looks like, which is rhetoric, which is fanning flames of division um, at, at the point of where he attacked um, Vice President Biden's family. Um, the families out there um, that know that addiction and turmoil are not um, exclusive to one economic sector, that it knows no, um, it doesn't know what size checkbook your family has. And those are real issues. And for him to use them as his tactile rhetoric and then to talk over and to talk loud, um, I think that there were points where questions were asked and Vice President Biden was ready to answer those questions. But the president just couldn't stop. And so let's not be mistaken. The debate was a spectacle. It was certainly not a debate. But one man on that stage was responsible for that. Does he lose from it? And you know, you know who loses from that? Those people that were new to the process that had hope that either one of these gentlemen had uh, ideas about moving the country forward. So I would hope in the next debate. I know that Vice President Biden and Senator Harris have great ideas, um, not to fan the flames of division, but how to get on the front end of these issues, how to solve the problems that most of us have to look at when we sit down at our dinner table or our kitchen table to pay our bills. And I think if they get an opportunity to express those and talk to the American people about them without the yelling, without the bullying, without the nonsense, without the clown-like behavior. Um, I think that um, President Biden and Senator Harris will resonate, but there were no winners coming out. No winners. No winners. It only hurt. All right, uh, Chairman Webb, uh, the president was criticized even within his own party. We've talked here the past half hour about matters of race and, uh, and divisiveness. Uh, the president flatly refused or refused to flatly condemn white supremacy, white nationalism. Uh, and that, that raised eyebrows even on uh, Capitol Hill on the Republican side of the aisle. How badly, uh, how bad a mistake was that? Well, Steve, I think you're mischaracterizing that to an extent. He said, sure, sure, uh, when asked if he would condemn it. His language was not strong enough, okay? Uh, he has uh, used language in the past and been very clear in the past that he condemns hate groups, that discrimination, racism has no place in America. Very clear in the past. Has done that several times. Uh, those questions continue to come up. Well, in the, same, would, in the, in the same in the same debate, so there he 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 signals the Proud Boys to what stand back and stand by. I can't remember the exact phrase. Down. Well, it's decidedly again, mixed message, what, was it not? I think the language was not good. I think what you do is you look and see what the president has done in the past, that you look at uh, the First Step Act, which has helped to uh, free African Americans from, from prison. You look at the uh, opportunity zones. You look at the low unemployment. A person that's a racist or a white supremacist doesn't do this to help every segment of our community, okay? I understand what you're saying, and I think uh, he should have been stronger in that language. Uh, clearly, you know, I'm not a racist, this party is not a racist party, and our president is not a racist either, okay? We do not support white supremacists, nor do we support Antifa. We do not know that from President, uh, Vice President Biden. And let me jump back on one thing. You know, school kids also heard a former vice president call the president of the United States, the leader of the free world, a liar, a clown. That's not the way that we should approach this, okay? And I'm hopeful in a second debate that uh, Vice President Biden is given all the time in the world 
so that we can understand his liberal and socialistic views of where he wants to take this country. He is the Democrat Party. He said that. I am the Democrat Party. So let's he said I'm the Democratic Party. Well, yeah, he said I'm the Democratic Party. Uh, let me say this. I did let right. me say this. I didn't interrupt you, Michael John. And I would appreciate it if you don't interrupt me. Okay. Well, let me but give that's what I have. Yeah. Yeah, but Chairman Webb, let me give Mr. Gray the last word here because we're down to about 90 seconds and uh, he has a, a right to respond there. So I was just correcting the, the quote. He, he said he is the Democratic Party. That's also something that Republican uh, Party has tried to do is drop that, but he is the Democratic Party. But I, I laughed and I'm sorry because it's a serious subject, but instead of saying that President Trump said to a white supremacist group, stand down and stand by, Instead of saying that was wrong, you went into all the things that uh, you say President Trump done has, has done for m minority groups in America. And I laugh because what that sounds like to me is, yeah, you may have heard me say all this, but I have black friends. That's ridiculous. He said it. It shouldn't have been said. He sh you should condemn it. The governor should condemn it. French Hill should condemn it. That, that is dangerous rhetoric from leaders. When you, whether you agree with the leader or not, when you have leaders that use that kind of language, it can incite and inflame. Instead of tamping down and bringing people together, it is inciting and inflaming, and it is dangerous. It is scary, dangerous. And I wish you guys would take a stronger stance on his language. That is, Mr. Webb, a frequent criticism, though, of the administration, that Mr. Trump is decidedly uh, injudicious in his, uh, in his language when it comes to matters of race, race and ethnicity. Your take. You know, there, there's many statements, Steve, in which he has condemned racism very clearly, very, very succinctly over the years. And, uh, you know, once again, uh, I think his record speaks clearly, and I think his support for bringing up those who have been less fortunate, uh, those who have been discriminated against, is clear. He is supportive of those areas. He is not a racist. He is not a white supremacist. He may have failings in the language he uses, but you can look at who he is and what he's done and know what he plans on doing in the future. The latest uh, uh, administration uh, action in terms of immigration policy, though, is not, would not appear to be uh, designed to win him any plaudits on that. On that, on that front in terms of ethnicity, terms of his alleged xenophobia. Mr. Whip? Well, once Sharply again, reducing I, again the number of the, yeah, go ahead. What, I, what did you just say, Steve? I missed what you said. Yeah, the, the latest administration directive sharply reduced, sharply reduced yet again uh, the number of those who will be uh, 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 granted immigration status. Well, I, clearly we need to solve our immigration problem and we need to deal with immigration in a very productive and careful manner uh, so that we, there's not any uh, misconception of our intent. Uh, I'm not familiar with exactly what you're speaking about, but that would be my perspective that we should be cautious and careful in immigration and we need to solve our immigration problem, both with the Congress and with the president. About 20 seconds remaining. Michael John Gray, it's yours. So I, I think that um, uh, if we take it from you, Mr. Chairman, that, that racism has no place in the Republican Party of Arkansas, then I would challenge you to stop your mailers, to stop your rhetoric, to stop your voices that tend to inflame and incite and play on the racial overtones or undertones. It takes us as leaders at the top of our parties, at the top of our government to say, we're not and we're not going to support, and we're not going to allow, and we're not going to gain from this kind of behavior. The Democratic Party's not doing it, and I would challenge the Republican Party and its leaders to do the same. All right, gentlemen, I have to end it there because we are simply out of time, and we gave both sides a little extra time uh, tonight. Thank Mr. you for Mr. being Barr, part sir, of the thank you. Thank you for being part thank of the you. program. We'll have you both back. We'll see you next week. Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR-FM 89.